Um, hello, everybody. Um, today, I will be talking more about the Elizabeth Brink exhibition, um, which is has already opened now. Um, this is a re-recording of the presentation that I did a few weeks ago, but the um, I don't think the recording worked very well. So um, I'm here and I'm going to record it. <laughs> um, and yeah, hopefully I can cover all bases. Um, so yeah, I'm Harriet. Um, you probably haven't met me um, as I've been around the museum. I've not been here long. I'm actually a placement student, so I'm studying um, MA Heritage Management at Bath Spa, um, and I've been working on the Elizabeth Frink exhibition um, with Nina and Monsi as part of my placement. Um, so that's been a really really nice opportunity um, and yeah so I'm excited to tell you more about what we've been doing um, and working on and um, yeah kind of just explore more explain more about the Frink exhibition which is already open now if you haven't already seen it um, which is very exciting. Um, I originally wanted to do kind of a guided tour of the exhibition but um, the um, yeah, obviously it took place the training session before um, uh, the installation. So um, yeah, I hope this presentation will do the job. Um, I'll just run through um, some of the key bits about the exhibition first. Um, so um, kind of key facts: who Elizabeth Frink was and the works on display, um, and then um, if you have any questions at the end, um, you've feel free to email me um, or Nina or Monty, I'm sure they're happy to help. Um, and yeah, hopefully it will be helpful. Yeah, so just some key facts firstly about the exhibition. Um, so obviously the exhibition is in the Worth Gallery. I kind of wrote this before it was opening. So um, some of these points will probably be a bit self-explanatory if you've already seen the exhibition. Um, but if you've not, so the exhibition contains nine works on paper and two sculptures, um, which are featured on the landing. Um, the works on paper um, come from two of Frink's print series. Um, we'll look at these more in, in more in detail later. Um, but these are first one, Canterbury Tales, and the second, Children of the Gods. So I think there's five from the Canterbury Tales and four from Children of the Gods. Um, and overall, the aim the, the aim of the exhibition, exhibition is to highlight Frink's um, printmaking work. So she was very famous for her sculpture, um, but not many people know that she actually did um, a lot of works, works on paper, lots of drawings, lots of screen prints, lots of etchings. Um, and so this exhibition tries to uncover this side of Frink and um, kind of allow the visitor to, to see some of these prints on display. Um, and some of the key themes that will be discussed um, in the exhibition are humour um, and these themes will kind of make more sense later on um, as we go through the works on display. Um, so storytelling um, through her interpretations, basically the works on tape paper um, are interpretations of different stories, so um, Greek mythology and classic stories. Um, and then finally violence, so some of the scenes that are shown in the prints are quite graphic and quite violent. Um, and then finally fantasy, um, as um, some of the stories that Frink depicts are kind of um, fantastical stories, uh, they are literature and they show kind of mythical beasts and immortal gods. So um, yeah, but that will kind of make more sense hopefully um, later on. But um, so some of you might know how the exhibition came about. Um, so the roots of the, the exhibition really go back to 2019 when the Holborn received a gift of um, 35 objects from Elizabeth Frink um, from the Frink estate. Um, so these were gifted to the museum um, and they include they include lots of on lots of different things. So um, I think there was three sculptures, two of which we are showing in the exhibition, but lots of lots of um, etchings uh, and drawings. Um, so I've shown um, 
these are some of the, the items from the acquisition that you can see on the screen. Um, this is on the left, one of her um, screen prints. Um, and this is one of the sculptures on display in the middle. And then this is one of her drawings at the end on the right. Um, so yeah, this is the Holborn's first opportunity to showcase some of these works by Elizabeth Frink, which is very exciting. Um, but yeah, so I, before we go on to look at what's actually on display, I wanted to kind of discuss a little bit about who Elizabeth Frink was and what she was known for, as visitors may um, already come in having a basic understanding of her work and um, particularly of her sculptures. So um, yeah. Yeah, so I first wanted to look a little bit about who Elizabeth Frink was um, and what she's known for, um, because her biography and her sculpture actually gives a lot of insight into the works on paper that are shown in the exhibition at Holborn. Um, so it's good to have kind of a basic understanding of um, it. So, yeah, Elizabeth Frink, she was born in 1930 in Suffolk. She was um, widely regarded as one of the um, greatest British sculptures of her generation and particularly um, as a woman artist of her generation. Um, she's mainly famous for her, um, her large bronze sculptures which can be seen all over the country and internationally. Um, she did a lot of commissions so they appear a lot in kind of outdoor public spaces and in museums um, which um, so you might have seen some of her work already without knowing it. Um, but she was often um, kind of named as post-war artist um, because her style of sculpture showed quite um, a, a ruggedness and abstraction. Um, the treatment of this, the surface of the sculpture was very rough, um, which you can also see in her prints. Um, I've included a few of the, her most well-known sculptures later on, so you can kind of see what I'm talking about there. Um, but yeah, she drew a lot on images of um, kind of masculinity, strength, struggle and aggression um, and she kind of used um, her sculpture to explore quite existential themes, um, what it's like to be human. Um, I th she also explained, um, kind of explored a lot about uh, masculine aggression and the futility of it. Um, I think personally that this comes from and I think a lot of other people think this come from um, her childhood. So she um, grew up near an airbase um, in the countryside um, and when she was nine years old World, World War II broke out so this meant she witnessed a lot of destruction um, as she was growing up. Um, what she recounts um, damaged aircraft returning to the airbase on fire and meeting a lot of military personnel um, and I think this kind of um, how she viewed um, these experiences in her life and um, the kind of aggression and um, pain that she probably saw as well. I think this kind of directly impacted on her later work. Um, and yeah, so you'll be able to see this um, for yourselves in a minute. But um, yeah, so because she grew up in the, the countryside, it also meant that she developed a love for the outdoors and for, for animals. Um, and this is also very clear in her work, both in her sculptures and in her works on papers. Um, as some of her best known motifs um, that she's known for are um, horses, birds, dogs, um, other animals. So she kind of grew, drew a lot from her love of animals. Um, and I think when she did depict animals, she really wanted to show almost the soul of the animal um, rather than kind of show a direct um, illustration of them, if that makes sense. Um, it was always about kind of um, not a direct image of the animal, but rather what um, it kind of represents for her. Um, so yeah, after she went to Venice when she was, I think, a teenager. And from seeing all the kind of artwork in Italy and the Renaissance works, um, she was inspired to go to art school. And she went on to study at the Guildford and Chelsea School of Art. And she actually is achieved kind of artistic fame very early on. At, um, only 22 years old when Tate bought one of her sculptures, Bird. Um, 
and yeah so this marked the beginning of a very highly acclaimed career. So with Frink's background in mind um, I've included this quote because I wanted to kind of point out where the exhibition name Elizabeth Frink Strength and Sensuality com comes from um, and I think it's something uh, a quote that really sums up her body of work and um, what she kind of chose to focus on in all kinds of media. Um, so I focused on the male because to me he is a subtle, a subtle combination of sensuality and strength with vulnerability. Um, and I think this is something that resonated um, with us in the curatorial office a lot. Um, and it's something that we saw both in this this sensuality and strength is something that we saw both in her sculptures, but also in her prints and her works and paper that we're displaying in the exhibition. Um, so we thought this was um, kind of a nice um, quote to draw from. Um, and we also liked that it kind of has this Jane um, Austen um, kind of strength and sensuality. It kind of has, yeah, an Austen vibe to it. Um, but it also does explain where the exhibition title came from briefly in the introduction text or in the exhibition. If you've um, seen it already, you might already know um, this. Um, so visitors can learn about that on the Worth um, Gallery landing. So just in case you are asked um, um, when in the gallery, um, yeah, you know where the titles come from. Yeah, so here are some of the Frank's most famous sculptures that I mentioned earlier. Um, so this is her, some of the sculptures from her series Goggle, Goggle Heads, um, which met, she made over a number of years. Um, and as you can see, these are quite aggressive and threatening busts of male heads. Um, and I think for Frank, they were actually quite anonymous symbols of brutality um, and of um, strength. Um, I think I read a quote where Frank said that for her, they became a symbol of evil. Um, yeah, so these are probably, if you Google Elizabeth Frank, some of the most likely sculptures to come up. Um, and you can kind of see where, where I was kind of talking about masculine aggression and strength and uh, the kind of rough treatment of the surface, especially in the, the sculpture you can see on the left. Um, this is kind of a technique that um, Frank is quite known for um, and which you see a lot in, um, in, her, in her sculpture. Um, and this is another of her uh, more famous works. Uh, this is Horton Rider. Um, and this was actually a commission um, for a site in Mayfair. Um, so if you are in London, you can see this, um, this sculpture for yourself. Um, Frank did a lot of commissions actually, which are now in public places and galleries all over the world. Um, so you might also know Walking Madonna, which is at Salisbury Cathedral. Or another kind of famous one is Risen Christ um, in Liverpool Cathedral. So she kind of did a lot of um, sculptures for religious sites and for public places in general. Um, but this one in particular was described by Frink as an ageless symbol of man and horse. And Frink um, explored horses a lot in her, in all kind of media of her work so um, not just in sculpture but also in her prints um, and you can see the horse motif come up a lot in the um, exhibition here at the Holborn so um, yeah it's quite a animals and horses they, they are quite a main focus for Frink um, but coming back to the main focus of the exhibition um, yeah so aside from her sculpture, Frank actually also explored print media a lot throughout her career and this is something that a lot of people who do know her work aren't actually familiar with. Um, but her experimentation with printmaking helped her to understand the sculptural form um, and she could uh, experiment and test different motifs and figures and shapes in her works on paper that would be used for her sculptures later, later on. 
So she enjoyed working closely with printers and learning new methods of printing, um, such as lithography, etching uh, and screen printing. Um, but ultimately, she was keen to make prints because she saw them as a good way for people to collect works of art um, in a cheap way and for her art in particular to be enjoyed by a large number of people. Um, and within printmaking, um, coming back to the focus of the exhibition, Frink explored her love of narrative and of literature. Um, so she was a, a wide reader herself. Um, she loved fictional narratives. Um, Sorry, my notes just <laughs> went AWOL there. Um, yeah, so she was a wide reader um, and she um, enjoyed fictional narratives. So I think it makes sense um, that she turned to experimenting with illustration and with illustration of narrative in particular. And this is um, what uh, the works and people that you can see in the exhibition are. So they are um, all illustrations of classical stories um, that Frank um, interpreted herself. So you could see, say that she saw these projects less as illustrations for um, for the story or for the text and more as a collection of her own thoughts or com comments on the story. Um, and so Elizabeth Frink's Strength and Sensuality examines two different series of illustrations um, made by Frink. Uh, I mentioned these earlier. Um, the first being um, illustrations um, from the Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer and the second series being um, a volume of Greek um, interpretations of Greek mythology, um, which were used uh, in a book by Kenneth MacLeish. Um, so I will now just go on to talk a little bit more about um, each of these series. So I'm sure some of you might already know about the Canterbury Tales, um, but um, just a quick overview of the Canterbury Tales, just so um, you can kind of understand Frank's illustrations of them uh, a bit better. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Canterbury Tales is considered to be this kind of masterpiece of med medieval literature. Um, it's a collection of 24 tales um, and the frame a uh, frame story is about a group of pilgrims um, who are travelling to the shrine of St Thomas Becket in Canterbury and along the way they compete in a storytelling contest and each of them tell 24 stories um, which are included in the tales. So in the, the early 1970s, um, so quite early on in Frink's printmaking career, um, she made 19 prints in total um, showing her own interpretation of the Canterbury Tales stories. Um, and these were um, definitely more interpretive rather than um, directly illustrative. Um, so what, my, what I mean by that is they often show figures and animals in the stories rather than um, kind of focusing on landscapes or backgrounds. Um, she wasn't really um, concerned with um, relaying a complete overview of the story, but she kind of chose um, certain moments which I think she found interesting um, and which I think she um, thought conveyed the spirit of the story rather than kind of um, just uh, directly illustrating it um, in that way. Um, yeah, so often these are quite humorous and witty reflections of Chaucer's narratives, which is a side of Frank as an artist, I think, that we don't often see. Um, her sculpture often kind of examined quite serious, quite heavy subjects. Um, so I think that's really nice. And you can um, definitely see this kind of humorous, more humorous side of Frank in um, the, the exhibition at the Holborn. Um, but yeah, so Frank worked with Nigel Oxley on these etchings and together they explore kind of a variety of different printmaking methods, um, which um, Frank were quite new to Frank. Um, and so kind of methods that were used to cut, score, um, burnish the etching plate to kind of have particular effects um, on the print itself. Um, so I'll kind of point out 
where you can see these methods in the, the works on display um, when I go through the works uh, later. But yeah, so the whole band came into possession of 14 of the prints from this series, um, and we wanted to include a selection of these for in the exhibition. Um, and yeah, so now I can go through which works these are. So the first is The Squire's Tale. Um, and so this is a story about, I think it's about a king who is gifted a ring. And when the wearer um, wears the ring, they can hear the thoughts and um, of birds. So as you can kind of see here in this um, print, uh, there is a, a lady and she uh, appears to, she's listening to the falcon. Um, here you can actually see that Frink has dedicated a lot more detail to the falcon rather than um, anything else in the picture, which I think is really interesting as birds were one of Frink's main motifs um, that she used in her both her prints and in her sculpture. And so that's kind of quite nice to see. Um, but yeah, I think this print really shows quite a gentle relationship between the figure, um, the lady and the animal. Um, um, which is one that we often see in Frink's work. She often um, kind of depicted the, the gentle relationship between man and animal, which I think uh, really is shown here in this print. So the next one is uh, The Tale of Sir Topaz. And this is um, this story is one of Chaucer's more lighthearted tales it's about a handsome knight um it's quite a satirical tale and i think that's why frink has chosen this perspective to um illustrate the story um so i, I think it's quite an unusual perspective to see the knight um through the legs of another person um and i think this kind of undermines the, the knight's traditional authority that he might have and kind of enhances the the humorous nature of the tale So then we have the Franklin's Tale, and this is actually one of my um, favourite um, prints, I think, in the series, if not in the exhibition. And that's because you can kind of see one of the more experimentative methods that Frink used in this series and that she explored. Uh, and that's in the background um, of the print. It's this very marbled effect. Um, it creates kind of uh, it looks like a starry sky in the background behind the figures. Um, and this was created by uh, a process called marbling. And this uh, involves, in the printmaking process, this Im involves immersing the etching plate in a tray of water and then pouring varnish onto the surface of the liquid, onto the surface of the water, um, to create a marbled pattern on the plate. Um, and kind of the result is this, very rich, very, um, very um, interesting background. It's quite reminiscent of water ripples, I think. Um, so I think this is quite nice that you can see Frink has been experimenting with printmaking and with the etching process um, in this print. So The Wife of Bath's Tale, I think, was one of Chaucer's more um, fascinating characters. Um, the Wife of Bath's Bath herself, um, she doesn't actually have any um, particular direct uh, link to Bath, um, but she, as a character, she was quite interesting because um, she had very radical views about married women um, and how they c should kind of act with their husbands, especially for the late medieval period when um, the Canterbury Tales was set. Um, so I think her character was likely of interest to Frink. Um, I think she, um, as a character, she had five husbands um, and I think she liked to have dominance over her husband and, um, and control in the marriage. And that was very um, unusual, of course, for um, this period of time when women were usually kind of the property of their husbands. Um, so I think you can kind of see that here in how Frink has decided to depict the wife of Bath. Um, you can see she's kind of in a reclined, almost arrogant posture. Um, 
And I think that really reinforces um, kind of the wife's dominance over her husband um, and kind of control in her marriage. So I think that's really interesting to know um, in Frink's interpretation. Then the Miller's Tale, uh, and this is the second, so um, Frink did two versions of the Miller's Tale. Um, and so this is one of um, Chaucer's more um, kind of bawdier narratives, and it's a narrative of lust and revenge. Um, and I think this uh, image in particular is a reminder of her quite robust sense of humour. Um, the etchings, it's interesting to note her etchings in this series in particular were mostly unmodified. Um, but in this image, uh, that's um, slightly different. So um, we think the, the flame in this image that you can kind of see in the middle um, was actually added after the traditional um, etching process and after the, the aquatint, it's called, um, was applied. Um, and this was possibly done by um, Frink scraping the surface of the metal plate um, to kind of reveal this flame shape in the middle. Um, yeah, so that's kind of all the works we've got from the Canterbury Tales series, um, so five in total. And now we can go on to look at the second series, um, Children of the Gods. So it's interesting that where the Canterbury Tales um, series wasn't really officially published anywhere, um, the Children of the Gods, which Frink created in, in 1988, um, this series was actually used in a book by Kenneth McLeish, um, which was a book of the complete Greek myths. Um, so, yeah, they were um, published. But there is actually a lot less information out there that can be found on this series of prints in comparison to the Canterbury Tales. Um, and I'm not really sure why. I don't know if it's because it was later in her career or by now when she'd already kind of completed quite a few narrative um, illustrative projects. Um, or just because there were less prints, I'm not really sure. Um, so it was a lot harder to find, kind of research this series. Um, but we do know that the etchings arise, aroused quite great interest um, when they were initially done. Um, and I think this could be because they show Frink, how um, Frink has really developed in her printmaking skills and by this point I think uh, this was 15 years or so after um, the country tales and you can kind of see how Frink is a much more established printmaker by this stage um, and kind of her techniques have really advanced from the country tales and that's very um, I think obvious in this stylistically in the the prints if you compare the prints of the children of the gods and country tales um, so they also show quite uh, a lot more violent depictions in the Canterbury Tales, um, um, as they are ba based on um, Greek mythology. Frink actually believed that the mythical world was not actually as calm and uh, polite a place as it is often made out to be in some um, literature. Uh, and I think her images reflect this. Sometimes they are quite, um, quite uh, uh, graphic depictions. But they, they often present a uh, tension between life and death, gods and immortals. Um, and that's really what um, she kind of chooses to focus on in, in this series. Um, we don't really know for sure the, um, the processes that Frink used or the technical process that, that Frink used in this series. But we do know that she used certain techniques um, um, that do make this um, series quite unique. So, for example, she used uh, a lot of aquatint, which gives the um, uh, prints, as you will see, um, more of a brownish colour than uh, the Canterbury Tales. Um, and she actually used re-etching of the plate. So going back after initially etching it to etch it again to give it a finer line um, and kind of more, you can see that the prints are more detailed than the Canterbury Tales might have been. So let's go on to look now um, about which um, prints are included in the exhibition. So the Holborn came to acquire seven prints from this series in the acquisition, and we chose to include four of these, which are um, Laos and Oedipus first. So, yeah, I, as you can see, this is kind of what I was talking about with the theme of violence. It's one of the more violent depictions in the series. 
and it shows um, the moment when Oedipus um, kills his own father in Greek mythology, um, Laos. Um, and yeah, I, I think it really attests to what I was saying before about her Frink's belief that classical myth was not really the calm place it's often made out to be. And um, I think that's really interesting. And you can kind of see that in the other prints in the series as well. Um, but here, yeah, um, we can also see um, Frink's motifs of horses that have popped up many times before and also in the Canterbury Tales. And um, yeah, one of the motifs she chooses to explore quite a lot. Heracles and the lion's mask. Um, so this is actually the lead image for this exhibition. So you've probably seen it before on the website. It's kind of the exhibition, the image that is used to promote the exhibition. Um, and I think it's also one of my favourites. I think it's quite um, a dynamic um, image. It shows a lot of movement. Um, and I really like kind of how um, Frink has portrayed the lion. So this is um, about um, Heracles and how he kind of defeats the, the vicious um, lion, Nemean lion, and um, he's kind of honing the animal's qualities here. And um, I think here that the lion's pose in, in particular is very defiant against the enemy, his enemy, um, and also the viewer. So I think that's um, um, quite nice um, to point out. Um, so this is Ganymede, um, and this is the story about how Ganymede, who, who is the, the boy um, beneath the eagle, and he is being abducted by um, the Olympian god Zeus, who is disguised as, disguised as an eagle. And he does this because of Ganymede's very um, intense beauty, and he kind of takes him off to be his, um, I think his cup holder off the top of my head. But um, yeah, so he kind of takes him away to the to serve the gods. Um, and so that's kind of the, the moment that Brink has chosen to interpret from this story. Um, but I think it's good to point out that this is also, I think this image in particular shows how far Brink has come with her printmaking skills. Um, and uh, you can kind of see the... the the use of etched washes, it gives this kind of um, uh, brown um, tint, but also kind of shading in certain places um, and kind of the softer line that's used to depict Ganymede. So I think that's quite um, nice to kind of uh, see how far Brink has come. Uh, and then finally, Her Hermes um, and Hermes was the um, messenger of the Olympian gods, and he could move freely between the worlds of the living and the dead. Uh, and you can see that Frank's really um, drawn from the symbolism here um, uh, of Hermes. Um, so, for example, she's uh, depicted the Talaria, which are the winged sandals, which Hermes is um, wearing, um, presumably to um, represent his role as messenger of the gods and how he could move between um, the living and the dead worlds. And then also the lyre, which is the musical instrument here that he's holding, and that is said to have been um, invented by um, Hermes. Um, so that's also, I guess, why she's um, included that. But I think the physicality of Hermes and kind of particularly um, his uh, torso and his head, I think that really evokes some of the Frink sculpture that she, um, and the, the typical anatomy that she used in when she portrayed the male body. Um, I think the, the head in particular reminds me a lot of the goggle heads that we saw before um, in kind of the, the way that it's uh, the jawline and the strong nose. Um, so I think that's um, kind of nice to see um, that kind of bring his drawing on her uh, sculpture in her printmaking. So that was um, all the full works that we've got from the Children of the Gods. Um, but now, obviously, we are also including, um, alongside the works on paper, two sculptures that were also included as part of the Frink acquisition. Um, so I think these were, we initially weren't going to uh, include any sculptures. Um, but we kind of changed our minds later on as we thought these were quite important pieces to be shown. Um, 
I think it doesn't it shows off kind of the collection of works we have here at the Holborn and it also kind of helps to depict some of the key um, themes and um, styles that we can see in the works on paper. Um, so yeah, these these two sculptures they're going to be shown, or they are being shown on the Worth Gallery landing. Um, if you haven't already seen them before, um, so I think visitors might turn up expecting to see some some of Brink's sculptures that might be kind of the the only knowledge they have about her, or um, they might have more. But um, yeah, she was mostly recognised for her sculpting work, so I think it's nice to include some of her sculptures. Um, so the first one we have is uh, this one on the screen, Maquette for Torso, um, which is um, it's not as um, big as I think it seems on the screen. It's probably about um, you can hold it quite easily in your hands. And so, uh, yeah, this will be shown on the um, the lower of the two showcases. Um, but I think this we wanted to include this one because you can kind of see it shows kind of the, the shapes and forms that Frink used not only in her sculpture, but in her works on paper. And you can kind of see um, it kind of draws on the male figure that she chose to portray a lot, um, which you can see in Hermes and Ganymede um, in, in the Canterbury Tales. Um, and yeah, I think that kind of just really reiterates how she often chose the male form over the more conventional female nude. Um, and then the second of the sculptures is Homme de Bellule uh, number four. Um, and this kind of, I think, resembles uh, to me more of the Prince and the Children of the Gods, just because of its um, uh, fant fant themes of fantasy. So this is, I, we assume, a winged man. Um, in French, Homme le Bellule number four translates to Dragonfly Man. Um, so I think it really kind of draws on the uh, mythological scenes that we see in the in the works on paper shown, uh, and kind of the wings, the winged man we can see often in Ganymede in particular with Zeus, uh, and then Hermes as well with the the winged uh, sandals, the Talaria. So we've seen um, what's on display and why, um, but I think I just wanted to end it on a few kind of reasons as to why should visitors come, you know, why why is it worth seeing the Brink exhibition? Um, and so I've, I've just put a few bullet points up, which are quite nice to point out. So um, firstly, a lesser known sign to one of the one of Britain's most important women artists. Um, Frink's unique tale on take on some of the most well-known tales and I think that particularly shows um, kind of her thoughts on the stories which is nice and they also often show kind of a more humorous side to Frink um, a more um, graphic side to the, to the stories um, so that's quite unique to be able to see that um, yeah, they also have quite a dynamic energy, as we've seen, particularly um, with Heracles and the lion's mask. Um, and they really show kind of how Frink has developed um, in her experimentation with printmaking as she goes throughout her career. And then many of um, Brink's best known motifs that um, visitors might already have knowledge of and might want to see uh, in person or um, in her kind of works on paper as well as in her sculptures, so including animals, winged figures, male torsos and horses. So finally, I just wanted to finish off with just a few practicalities um, and some kind of points about the wider collection, as I know you, um, you might be uh, yourselves in the gallery um, and visitors might have some questions about the exhibition and the wider collection um, at the Holborn. Um, so firstly, how many other Frink objects are there at the Holborn and will we ever show them? So there are 24 other objects by Frink um, that aren't on display. Obviously, due to the size of the Worth Gallery, we were quite limited in how many um, uh, works that we could display. Um, but there are quite a, a number of other um, works on paper and another sculpture that we aren't showing. Um, so we think um, 
ad hoc displays like this. One might happen in the future, but um, at the moment we don't really have any solid plans to display them permanently. Um, I think especially because works on paper are quite delicate and um, that has to be taken into account. Um, so how can we engage visitors in conversation about the wider collection? Um, so I think it's just, um, as always, as I'm sure you always are, just being open to talking about kind of the works um, and maybe um, asking if the visitor has ever they know about any of the other um, works that we have here at the Holborn, if they've have ever heard of Frink in particular um, before, if they know of any other works, just kind of um, getting them into conversation about Frink and um, yeah. And then finally, are there any practicalities um, to the exhibition that we should keep in mind? Um, so obviously the, the light level in the gallery, if you haven't already been in there, is quite low and this is just standard to prevent um, damage to the works on paper, um, light damage. All the works are glazed um, so and framed, so you don't need to worry about that. And the sculptures are also protected in showcases. Um, yeah, so. Um, yeah, so then finally questions. This was um, mainly um, for when I did the presentation in person a few weeks ago um, and I did answer a few questions then um, but if you do have any other questions if you've made it this far in the presentation and you just, um, have some questions you'd like to ask um, feel free to get in contact with me um, I'm sure you can get my email from Spencer or um, yeah feel free to ask Nina or Monsi at the Holborn and I'm sure they'll be happy to help um, I just wanted to finish off quickly that I have included some um, links to wider reading on Frank and the Canterbury Tales, the Children of the, bot, the, the Gods and just how the general printmaking process as well. Just in case you were interested, um, uh, that is um, kind of links that you can find out more information about those things. I think the printmaking process in particular, I've included some videos to how you can kind of see visually how this works as I think it's quite hard to explain just um, through a presentation rather than showing. So if you were interested in how Frink has made the prints on display, you can kind of see how that works um, there. But just to finish off saying thank you for listening, if you've made it this far, I hope it was um, informative uh, and I hope you have a chance to go and see the exhibition yourself. Um, and I'd be um, very happy to hear what you kind of think of it. I've not actually gone to see it yet since it's been installed, so I need to go and have a look myself, so I'm very excited to do that. But um, yep, thank you for listening. <laughs>